Welcome back, everybody. Segment number three on Monday afternoon here at Business Monday at Go Local Live. I'm Josh Fenton, CEO and co-founder of Go Local. This is the money man, Gary Sass. Cha-ching. Uh, Gary Sass, this is how important the money man is. And I'm not sure if this is the fiscal insights of Gary Sass or the influence of your tremendous wealth. But Friday night, <laughs> all memory. the reporters are up meeting with with Speaker Nick Mattiello and a uh, reporter from one of the other news organizations says, is the URI governance legislation in the budget? And the speaker says, yes. And this reporter says, well, why is it in the budget? And the speaker says, because Gary Sass says that this is the most important economic development issue pending before the legislature this session. That is how influential, and I, as I say, I don't know if it's the fiscal insights of Gary Sass or if it's just the largesse of your wealth that influences legislators, uh, but that's the reality. The URI governance bill is in the budget, and I believe you are the uh, uh, maybe potential, to, we'll have to do the paternity suit, but you might be the father of the influence of that. Well, that's a good thing to bother. <coughs> Probably an all-American someday. No, it's really an You do have child support, though, now, and yeah. you're going to have to pick up any deficits at your eye. <laughs> yeah. it's, re it's really an important storm. That's what that's about. Um, uh, budget comes out Friday night. The speaker, uh, Chairman Abney and Joe Sicarci, the majority leader, brief the press for a good 45 minutes, maybe to an hour, and then race downstairs to pass it in the committee before the midnight, uh, before uh, Cinderella loses her, her shoe, uh, running out of the state house and pushing the budget out even further delayed. Um, uh, a big brawny budget with a bunch of Christmas tree items uh, attached. What's your take on this budget? Well, the first take uh, is the legislature improved the budget. Yep. Uh, the budget that was submitted by the governor, and we'll talk about it, uh, really was a tax and spend you know, budget, and there seemed to be little symmetry to some of the decisions. So I think you got to give the legislature a lot of credit because they did improve a budget, and they, had a, they didn't really have a great budget to begin to work with. I think in trying to evaluate the budget, there's some information we have and some we don't have yet. And so the first question I always ask about the budget is, is it fiscally sound? And I judge fiscal soundness by really just two things. Is it operationally in balance next year? That, does that, that means does current revenue and current expenditure equal? Uh, if not, it's a deficit budget. And what does the out-year forecast look? We know there's a structural problem. And I heard the speaker say that the structural problem continues. Yeah. So one way to judge the budget is, is, is that there was a status quo maintained? Are we still in that kind of uh, neverland of having a a deficit so we can't do anything important, or has it gotten worse or has it gotten better? I think uh, one of the things he spoke to, which was interesting uh, during the briefing, was um, it was concern that here we are in a low uh, unemployment economy. There's a number of elements of the economy that are quite positive, and yet very, very reluctant to incur longer-term reoccurring costs that might paralyze the state in the case of a uh, recession. Well, and that's not just true in the state of Rhode Island. That's, there's a lot of anxiety in the country. With 3.6% un unemployment, uh, you think there'd be less of that anxiety. So that anxiety exists. And it's more than anxiety in Rhode Island. Last time we spoke, I mentioned that we But there's no anxiety in Congress. They just keep spending away. Oh. There's much, much. I thought much more maturity amongst the legislative leaders this year. Give them the credit where the well, credit there's, is there's due. One reason. Congress just keeps printing money and spending well, it. Well, there's two reasons. Democrats and Republicans. There's two reasons. Uh, you know, the first reason is states have to balance their budgets. The federal government, you know, does does yep. not. And the second uh, is uh, one of the political parties up there is Moribond. Uh, there's not much independent thought coming from Republicans who have been the past. Uh, been deficit hawks, so that's that's the, the reality. Uh, but there's still, as far as little state is concerned, uh, if you continue to have structural deficits, there are opportunity costs, there are opportunity right. loss, and so 
in judging the budget, is it fiscally sound? We get those numbers, we'll know. The second, uh, did any, was anything done in this budget to improve the way state government operates, to make it more efficient and more effective? It doesn't seem that there was. The, I, don't, uh, I don't think there was any transformational uh, changes in, well, not, in the management of, of government, no. Not, not many organizational changes. Uh, I guess they eliminated. No consolidation of departments, no transformation of the union system and, and dealing, or anything dealing like that. Dealing with technology and no. such. Uh, they did, I'm told, uh, eliminate uh, positions, vacant positions that have been lingering on the books for a long time. That yep. would be positive. And then the third thing was response to community needs about the programs. Now, this is always politically arguable because you can, when you, this is, gets into the question, is what is the government going to spend its money on? What are its priorities? And there are people that have different opinions. I look at it, and I think it was pretty good. I think they did a good job on meeting community needs. That doesn't say they did it in the most fiscally or unfiscally responsible way, but just in terms of, the, of meeting the community needs. We talked about UI governance. I thought that was important. Uh, we talked about uh, we didn't talk about education. They did a good job on education. They uh, funded the formula, which they're supposed to, but they also... Uh, put some additional money in uh, for bilingual, which is a primary driver of some of the low test scores in the in the urban, urban areas. Yeah, five million in new do, new dollars. Yeah, I, I it was, and then they, and then they also uh, put a little money in. I don't know if it's enough, but to uh, do curriculum revision, to mm -hmm. revise the curriculum, the curriculum frameworks. So it was progress. We made progress on education, both at the higher level and at the elementary. And, and the speaker said it was 41 point something million yeah. in new education. Well, funding. that's not quite right. That there were, there, there was, there was, yes, he's right. But 34 of that million was there anyhow. Yeah. 34 was, or well, 35 was what was needed to fund the formula. Right. And so that was going to be there anyhow. But, but they did fully fund pilot. Which was a change over the governor's budget. Oh, that's well. See, that's the, that's the unwritten story about this thing. You know, we're sitting here, you know, talking about the positive things they did in the budget, and there were a number of, of, of positive things. But maybe the most important thing they did in the budget was they looked closely at some of the governor's recommendations, and they really uh, <clears throat> took a, a stick uh, to those or uh, an axe to those that they felt. Uh, we couldn't afford and where a good case was made. So I sit back and I'm really complimentary of the legislature for having the courage uh, and doing the, the work to, you know, knock out some of the governor's requests that uh, were not in the best interest of the state. So taking pilot money away from cities, which would effectively hurt, you know, Providence. And you look around, you see right. that, that the money uh, was needed. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Most of the tax increases were gone. They left one major tax increase, and there are probably several fees in there that we don't know, we haven't seen yet, but uh, they, the only tax increase was the tax on digital downloads, the right. so-called Net Netflix tax. And we can talk about that, whether that was a good idea or a bad idea, but the point is that most of the other tax increases were taken out of the budget. Uh, they uh, didn't, this is, not, and I said this gets to one's opinion, they didn't legalize marijuana. They did increase the com uh, compassion, compassion centers. centers. Uh, significantly from, from, from th and I'll also give them credit. They increased the number of compassion centers from three to nine. There was an effort by the lobbyist for the three, or one or two of the three, to guarantee them first right of refusal for the additional ones. That got uh, fended off, and I think that was good public policy oh, yeah. to keep that open. I, I think they were trying to pull a greyhound uh, owner's uh, scam where the Greyhound owners got paid millions and millions of dollars for many years after Greyhound racing had functionally stopped up at Lincoln but got uh, payouts the forevermore. Form. That was I know the lobbyists didn't negotiate yeah, I that. Believe I believe it was the same <laughs> lobbyist trying this maneuver as well. <laughs> well yes. As you get older. Who's you... also the lobbyist for the Providence Journal, by the way. Okay, well, as you... As you as Keeping you... in the requirements of legal notices for the paper of record. And yeah, so, you know, it, it also, they also, uh, on the governor's uh, universal pre-K program, and no one's against pre-K, but f as a responsible fiscal issue, we can't afford any more entitlements. Right. And so while the legislature did some to improve uh, the number of slots, they increased the slots by about $280 million, and 280. They, 280, right. Yeah. 
and they were and they reduced the uh, they well, not reduced but made up for the loss of federal money for that program. It's a far different cry from an entitlement program, which would have cost tens of millions out in, into the future, where there was no clear indication that that we could get it. So as you as you go, th oh, another very positive thing I thought, uh, and it also says something about uh, the policy on creating tolls, uh, which I, I think when the everything is done, we're going to find out that may, that may not have been the best way to go. Uh, they issued, they allowed Garvey bonds uh, to uh, rebuild the uh, 95 aqueduct that yep. goes through, through Providence. And I could tell you, I'm very familiar with that when I worked as in the administration. Uh, that's needed, and, and, they, and putting in the $260 million, uh, is probably a wise thing to do. Uh, it'll have a major impact on Providence. So <clears throat> there are a number of positive things in the budget. Uh, particularly in, in education. Oh, we didn't talk about nursing homes and hospitals. Yeah. Uh, uh, the nursing homes were pretty much held whole in this budget, which hasn't always been the case. And some of the cuts made to hospital reimbursements and payments uh, were, were restored. So uh, overall, as you look at the budget, uh, you really... For and just so we look at the nature of our hospitals in Rhode Island, lifespan, I think, l last fiscal year lost money this year is, is up m mildly. Care New England, who operates three different hospitals, women and infants, Kent and Butler, uh, is back losing money over the last three years. They've lost $130 million. And uh, Charter Care, the privately held, is breaking even, I think, at best in Rhode Island. So, uh, you know, if we're going to have a vibrant health care industry and it's going to be an economic engine, it's got to have some economic strength to it. Yeah, and so and they've also, they also... Uh, Restore the more aggressive schedule to phase out the motor vehicle tax. The government right. wanted to cut back on that. <clears throat> so you, as you, you look at the budget and the decisions made about community need and what they restored and what they didn't fund, it seems to be a, a fairly responsive, you know, budget to what people were interested in and discussed. And when we see the numbers on on the uh, out year forecast and some of the uh, uh, fiscal soundness questions, then we'll be able to put a grade. So right now, I wouldn't grade the budget, but I would say in terms of it's a better budget than, than the governor presented, uh, and there are some decisions that were made in the budget which I think will prove helpful over the long run. You, you know, it's always perplexing. I think we talked about it when the governor introduced her budget. It, it didn't seem to have any strategy to it. This budget seems to have a strategy, whether you like it or don't like what's, it. What's the strategy? Uh, fiscal conservatism, this, this budget, th this one. It's uh, uh, don't get engaged in longer term, high, potentially high price entitlements, uh, not going forward with r the expansion of pr promise to Rhode Island College, which then would have forced further expansion of promise at Rhode Island College and potentially at URI, and you're not talking about a four to five million dollar program anymore, now you're talking at a 20 million dollar program. Uh, going forward over the next few years. So I think those were the two things that um, were, uh, deserve some credit at least having a strategy as to what the legislature was trying to do. The other element which was unusual and is certainly positive in just the management of the state was while the House was voting on the budget, House Finance was voting on the budget, the Senate president sent out a statement functionally endorsing the budget, being an indication that he has signed off on all the major provisions of it, uh, which obviously has not been the case the last few years where House and Senate relations fell apart in the waning days of the last two legislative well, sessions. Sometimes the bu well, sometimes it wasn't the budget. Sometimes the budget was caught in a crossfire yeah. over extraneous kinds of issues. Yeah, so, so you hoping for more? more uh, fireworks out of the House and Senate? No, no, <laughs> I, I, I was glad they finished by whatever it was before before 12. And it's, it also sends mixed signals in some way. One issue that hasn't been discussed very much uh, was it didn't take any action on the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And the governor had proposed increasing the minimum wage, I believe from $10.50 to $11.10. And it's interesting because Massachusetts, uh, my understanding, is that their minimum wage this year you know, rose to twelve dollars, and Connecticut's right. is scheduled to increase too. So I, I was surprised there wasn't more discussion about that. The only thing I heard uh, was that the speaker said it wasn't included because the business community didn't want it. But I think uh, that's something that I wish there had been more 
discussion about progressives certainly uh, reacted uh, negatively on Friday night and into Saturday criticizing the budget for not including a increase in the minimum wage that was probably the number one issue that progressive members of the legislature spoke out about well and, and I you know I think if the states around you had a lower minimum wage uh, you know that would be a, a sign of caution they don't and because they don't, I think a clear explanation is owed to the progressives and to you know, working people as to why the minimum wage wasn't increased. You know, keep in mind, there are winners and losers when you increase the minimum wage, but there may be more winners as more money flows to the economy. And if you talk about you know, a job being the best welfare program, then you really want to make sure that that pay in that job uh, you know, is commensurate with that philosophy. So I've always gotten a kick out of conservatives who say, well, we got, should increase the minimum wage. Well, sometimes you shouldn't, but sometimes you shouldn't. And I think there was a lot more on this issue that wasn't said that should have been said. Yeah. Um, was there anything else in the budget? From a philosophy standpoint, adding URI, adding 195, adding some of these other major pieces of legislation, adding them into the budget as a budget article to assure their passage, um, is that good governance or is that smart governance? Well, smart politics because <clears throat> you don't have to worry about a veto on a controversial issue. You know, that's always been a concern. And uh, you know, as a purist, I would rather see the budget have less uh, things that could be should be legislated as, as opposed to included in the budget. Uh, yeah, in this case, I'm happy to see what happened. Uh, you know, with URI. Uh, the other thing that we haven't discussed, which I think it was also an important factor is the speaker talked about shortening the leash, 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 you know, thank you, hold your door for, uh, um, for Commerce R.I., uh, because, you know, there clearly is a case. He, he, I would say his narrative was very similar to some of the critiques you have made over the past few months. Might have been osmosis traveling up to uh, uh, no, I don't. I, I, think, I think it's the obvious, you know, we, we are going to put out some data which compares Growth. We meaning the Hassenfeld Institute and, and Bryant University. And the Economics Department of Bryant. Yeah. Uh, which compares the growth in Rhode Island, not, not over just the governance term, but over a five-year period, you know, for jobs, for GDP, for productivity, uh, for population change, for educational I mean, All the factors, there are about 15 factors, that indicate uh, whether you're growing or not or whether the growth is sustainable. And with one exception, we lag the national average in Massachusetts and, and all of those factors. So I think the speaker had every right to say, well, we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in economic development and a couple of things are not happening. Our relative position is not improving that much compared to the national average and compared to all of Massachusetts. And second, we're not attracting clusters. We're, 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 we may, we're making some decisions that encourage investment. Uh, the trades are happy with it. There's, there's construction jobs that are, that are coming forward. But for all this money we spend, what happens when we finish spending it? And, you know, I, I looked at the rebuild program, which the governor would originally asked for another $100 million to, to the cap, and, and the uh, legislature agreed $50 million. But they also put a proviso in that uh, the sales tax exemption given for materials uh, would be included, as I understood it, in the, in the $50 million. Yep. So they really didn't get, you know, very much of, a, of an increase in that. But if you got 30 or 32, three projects, and you know, six or seven are hotels, and others are apartment houses, which most people in the state couldn't afford to live in. Then you have to say, well, it, it, those. The, I'm not questioning each project, but how does that fit into the overall strategy of economic growth? And what the speaker was saying, we better uh, maintain a better handle on, on what's happening, and they did so by controlling the purse, which is what the only thing they can control. Um, let's leave Smith Hill. Let's go to Capitol Hill. You're part of a national effort called No Labels, uh, releasing uh, a 2020 uh, agenda of eight uh, distinct points in which you're encouraging members of Congress, presidential candidates, national leaders to sign on to uh, on everything from immigration to energy policy. Um, uh, governing technology companies across the board. Uh, talk a little bit about that effort and some of the impact that it's already had 
on the mm -hmm. rules of the of the House of Representatives in Washington. Okay, well, just for by way of introduction, you know, No Labels is a national organization. Uh, it's composed of Democrats, Republicans, and, and Independents, uh, and its real mission is to try to bring people together to, to compromise and to develop bipartisan solutions to some of the problems that the country is facing uh, that it hasn't, hasn't addressed. Uh, it does three things. It's built this program on policy, which is where we can talk about the agenda, on politics. Uh, it supports the legislators that will do bipartisan things. And the result uh, was, in the House, the creation of a Problem Solvers Caucus, uh, which is composed of 24 Democrats and 24 Republicans. Uh, and they have been working on legislation. Their greatest accomplishment was they leveraged uh, their votes to uh, get some reforms as a quid pro quo for voting for Nancy uh, uh, Pelosi for, for Speaker. And then their third stool, or third leg of their stool, uh, is citizen participation, mm -hmm. you know, grassroots movements. And so <clears throat> that's the organization. This year they, they did something that I think is going to have quite a bit of, n of influence on the national election. They put out a 2020 unity agenda. Now, I don't agree with everything in the unity agenda. And I'm sure my liberal friends don't agree with everything in the unity agenda either. But it's, and we can talk about some of the highlights, but it's going to be a, very, a document that will be proactively used. To, there's going to be a, a meeting, I don't, we're going to announce it in Manchester soon during the New Hampshire primary. Uh, and, and to insert into the presidential election, uh, particularly the general election, uh, this unity agenda and try to get the candidates uh, to you know, talk about you know, issues and how they would respond to the unity agenda. And so when you go through it, you, you see a number of things. Health care is one. And so they talk about letting people voluntarily buy into Medicare uh, at 55. I've always felt the right age was 60. I've spoken that about before. Uh, but they want to reduce costs through tort reform and, and drug negotiation. And, and you, we know the trial lawyers on the, on the other side uh, don't like tort reform. Uh, they want to do something to increase the supply of doctors, uh, and then they want a, a basic catastrophic health insurance for everybody. Uh, so if you're injured in an accident, uh, you're, you're, you're covered. It's not the kind of insurance you use for your right. daily life. Uh, on energy, they talk about a carbon tax. But there's one caveat, which is, again shows how they bring things together. So the carbon tax is to deal with energy and climate change, but instead of keeping the money, the money that's collected from the carbon tax would be a rebate to every taxpayer in the country. So you'd accomplish the objective of not being accused of putting on more taxes and more right. tax and spend and tax and spend, but you'd be doing something to affect uh, fossil fuels, putting them in a less competitive advantage, but the money would go back to the people's. Uh, uh, infrastructure, something that we do here, every state does, a capital budget. Uh, you know, if the uh, U.S. government is going to take on a major infrastructure project, it's, it's in the budget is taken on. There's not a capital, you know, budget process. So there, there's reform on, on infrastructure, on tech, high tech, uh, uh, privacy protection. But they also want to move on uh, artificial intelligence accountability because that is going to be uh, the future through an office of a technology assessment and then to reinvigorate the antitrust laws, the old Sherman Antitrust Act of 1896. Workforce development. Do you need to reinvigorate it or just enforce it? Uh, you need to reinvigorate it because the thing the, with high-tech companies is different. I'll give you an example. Back in 1956, they wanted to break up Bell, Ma Bell, and they cut a deal I don't, with AT&T that AT&T would do something about analogs or something where they found it in, in the interest of the consumer not to break up at t at that time, but get the advantage of whatever technology they right. were using. So you need to look at it a little bit differently, but, but you get the picture of what yeah. they want to do. On immigration, uh, they want more emphasis on employment-based immigration. You know, five to one, it's family-based immigration now. Uh, they're not afraid to talk about building a wall. They, they say it's okay to build a wall where it's appropriate. Uh, uh, they uh, want more vigorous enforcement of our uh, immigration laws. More people are in the country illegally because their visas have expired than, than actually you know, coming through Tijuana, or, uh, what, what that is. Uh, and they want a more liberal approach to the dreamer. So you see all these ideas coming together. And that, that should be a compromise, and the theory is that people on both sides can support that. Uh, on, on the money, there was something called the magic money tree. They, they want to put something uh, in law uh, which uh, says that... Uh, 
there's a debt to GDP ratio. And if you're going to exceed the debt to GDP ratio, you can do so in case of war, and you can do so if there's an extra majority vote uh, in, in the Congress. Uh, on fixing the system, they have some things that are pretty controversial. One uh, is because of all the circus around our Supreme Court is, is, is take away the lifetime appointment mm -hmm. and say you can serve one 18-year term as a member of the mm. su Supreme Court. Uh, now it should be 18 or 25 years, I don't know, but it, it, it'll allow for churn and, and modernization. Uh, they talk about a national primary day. Um, and then they also talk about universal service to bring us together, you know, one year doing something for the community. So every eight year, I could sit and take apart each of those ideas from my own political perspective, and people on the other side, <coughs> excuse me, could do the same. But the strong feeling of, 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 of no labels is that some adult in the room needs to put something together that represents progress, represents dealing with issues, represents compromise, that you can't do it. You know, a university could do this and no one paying attention to right. it. The only way you can get attention paid to it in a real political sense is to then insert it into the campaign. And um, there's a grassroots movement being organized to try to do, do that. Do you think we'll see uh, situations in which presidential candidates, the one Republican or the 24 Democrats, will endorse at least aspects of it and say, listen, I can't sign on to all eight pillars, but I, I strongly agree with three of these or four of these? Or I, I would hope so. I, health is a good example. Every, every poll that both sides talk about say health is the number one issue. Well, we, we, you know, if the Democrats say, you know, Medicare for all, which even all their 24 candidates know is impossible, right. they can't do it, uh, and the Republicans say nothing, you know, in yeah. terms of the get rid of Obamacare, there's not right. much there. If somebody injects into the debate, okay, what about catastrophic health insurance? What about a Medicare buy-in when you're, I think, 55 is too young, but, 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 but 60? Uh, you know, what about uh, reducing the cost by having a real um, uh, drug negotiation, which uh, big farmers, you know, kept from happening? So, yes, I think there's a real, you know, possibility. Uh, it depends on who the candidates are. And one thing I'm, I'm learning in a very personal way, and a very, it's a much smaller microcosm, <clears throat> the people that are criticizing what we're trying to do are the extremes. Yeah, right. The, the people in the middle, I, I, if, we, if, if we can develop a grassroots movement, and if people in the middle see this as a uh, you know, sane way to begin to deal with our problems, uh, I think candidates will, they may not even talk about the 2020 unity agenda, but we'll, we'll, we'll pick up some of his ideas and... Um, Use some of the language. Well, well the idea of the language, but, but more importantly, the proposals, yeah. Um, all of it can be found on Go Local this morning. It's, uh, uh, is that the president? Uh, well, what? Uh, uh, <laughs> you never know who's calling Gary Sass. It could be some uh, international art dealer offering <laughs> him a stolen Picasso or... Uh, or my wife tell me to bring home some milk or something. <laughs> yeah. Or his wife bringing home the milk. Uh, congratulations on your leadership on this. I know that there's a lot of folks working on trying to bring uh, the, the two parties back together and begin to find some uh, more common ground in America uh, and find some solutions so that year after year, Congress is not impeded from, from finding solutions to complex issues. Uh, it's certainly going to be a dynamic uh, presidential election over the next uh, nearly uh, 18 months. And, and a lot of leadership has to come from the White House because of, uh, you can and see... do we expect that? D well, I'm not going to handicap the election. Long way to go. I can read the polls. I guess you, if you don't like the results of polls, there's a simple way to fix it. Fire your, fire your pollster. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's one way to do it. Um, listen, everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Gary Sass, thank you for all your insights into both the budget and discussion on Unity 2020, the agenda, bipartisan effort to bring America together. Uh, you can see all eight of those pillars on Go Local. Uh, check them out. It's worth the read. I think they're very thoughtful. Um, we'll be back tomorrow. Lots going on in Providence tonight. Lots of discussion about the new tax
structure being proposed. Maybe we'll pick up on that next week and uh, look forward to uh, Kate Nagel being live tomorrow afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate all the attention. <coughs>